A brief note before this episode with Dan Jones on the year 1147 and the Crusades. Now, Dan is a brilliant speaker. We caught him at his home on a lucky free day. Instead of recording the usual hour, we left with about 90 minutes of superb historical analysis and storytelling. That's obviously far too long for one of our normal episodes. So we thought we'd give you the chance for a little fee to download our whole conversation. It'll help to support the podcast and I promise you something quite brilliant in return if you do. If you're interested, just find the file on our feed. If not, there's a 45 minute edit here for you as ever for free. So without further ado, welcome to season two of Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with History Today the world's leading serious history magazine. So this is the first episode of our second season of Travels Through Time, the podcast where we examine one year in history with an expert guest in three telling scenes. Welcome back. We'll be bringing you new time travels every Tuesday right through till Christmas, which, my apologies for the jolt, is just 17 weeks away. But today we're starting with history on a grand scale. The crusading era spanned almost four centuries and stretched across a geographic area from the Holy Land to modern day Spain. But what was the point of it all? What did it mean to be a crusader in this time? Who were the chief combatants and what were they fighting for? I'm going to put questions like this to today's guest. Dan Jones is a historian, journalist and broadcaster. His books, including The Plantagenets and The Templars, have sold more than one million copies worldwide. Next up for Dan is Crusaders, an exhilarating character-led tour through the crusading era. It's published this month. It's a pleasure to be talking to you, Dan. Welcome to Travels Through Time. Well, thank you very much for having me. Right, let's begin by talking generally about the Crusades. What were they? And a personal question, why did you get interested in them? I'll answer those questions in reverse order and say that I got interested in the Crusades. Well, you can't really miss the Crusades if you write about medieval history. And I've been doing that for sort of 15 years or so now. Um, I, I defined the Crusades in a very broad sense, which is to say not just looking at the um, papal-sponsored missions from Western Europe, starting with the First Crusade, preached by Urban II in 1095, to go to the Holy Land. Because as we're going to unpack, I think, over the the course of this episode, uh, what's really interesting to me about the Crusades is that they could be different things to different people. They spread, they metastasized as the period went on until you know two or three hundred years after crusading began in with quite a limited focus, there was crusading going on absolutely everywhere um, against absolutely everyone, Christian on Christian crusading and not just Latin on Greek, but Spanish kings fighting each other and both claiming that the war was a crusade. So, so that's kind of one or rather the central fascination to me of this period. Yeah, and I think this is what comes across with your approach that you touched on then is to look at the individual characters who were part who all together make up this great big story because if you were really to ask someone to draw their picture of what a crusader might look like you'd get something I imagine in general sense a bit like the character in Monty Python's Holy Grail of a you know a knight on horseback carrying the great tear-shaped shield kind of across a bleak landscape somewhere towards the east. But of course there were lots of different characters involved in this story. You go and talk about Vikings at some point. There's obviously crusades within Europe. They don't just go towards the Holy Land. And I think it's this multiplicity of voices which attracted me about your approach. So it's about, the word is much overused these days, diversity. But I think that that is at such a, a hugely important part of understanding the Crusades. Hundreds of thousands of different people were involved in this phenomenon over centuries, and all of their experiences were different. And you've gone for 1147. Do you want to tell us what's going on in terms of this grand master narrative? If we're going to look more closely at 
at close range at 11.47, what's happening then? You're right, I thought, I thought long and hard about 10.99 as this kind of year that Jerusalem fell to the first Crusaders and in many ways the high point of, uh, of crusading achievement. But 11.47 is fascinating to me because it's almost 50 years since Jerusalem fell to the first Crusaders. You know, the 50th anniversary of that date is coming up. Um, and there will be, uh, in, you know, in 1149, big celebrations in Jerusalem. But it's also a tipping point in the history of the Crusader state. The First Crusade had set up the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the County of Tripoli, the Principality of Antioch, and the County of Edessa, these four Latin-ruled Crusader states in Palestine and sort of coastal and northern Syria. In 1144... The first of those to have been established, the county of Edessa, was partially conquered, and the the capital city, Edessa itself, was conquered by Imadadin Zengi, a Turkic Atabeg and very powerful and quite brutal warlord, effectively, ruler of Aleppo and Mosul, who had swept into Edessa and taken it from the hands of its, its Latin Christian ruler. This was a major shock to not just the Crusader states in the East, but to the Latin Christian world in general. Because the achievement, the high achievement of seizing the city of Jerusalem and establishing these Crusader states in the 1090s had seemed to be manifest proof of God's favour for the crusading mission. And here we are nearly, you know, just approaching the 50th anniversary of that achievement. And wow, it all seems to be possibly starting to come apart. So shock waves have sort of rippled out from the Crusader states across across the Mediterranean world and particularly Western Europe. And, and the, the result of those shock waves is that there are calls going out from the Pope to the, the great rulers of Western Europe to repeat the deeds of the First Crusade, to go and sort this, this business out in the East. But allied to that, there are other movements going on in crusading which are seldom so carefully looked at by historians. And, and the two that I want to focus on in looking at 1147 are the beginning of what will become the Northern Crusades or the Baltic Crusades in the form of the Wendish Crusade, which is you know, Saxons um, in the Kingdom of Germany starting to push northeast into new non-Christian lands, uh, claim them for themselves and call it a crusade. While at the same time linked to the Second Crusade, which is the mission to the east to go um, avenge loss of Edessa, you have a big step forward or backwards, depending on your point of view, in the Reconquista, which is, again, rather understudied second theatre of crusading. The mission on behalf of the Christian kings of northern Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, to advance further and further south until they've claimed the whole peninsula from Islamic rule. Now, all of these three things are connected. They're not equally well known, but they have deep and important connections which tell us a lot about the nature of crusading in general and about the nature of crusading as it was changing in this really important point in the middle of the 12th century. Okay, perfect. So we've had, in a paraphrasing sense, we've had this great moment of the First Crusade, which has been tremendously successful. And I think just in terms of geography, Edessa, which is the key to this era we're talking about, or maybe the catalyst for the history that we're going to be talking about, then, it sits really, doesn't it, just... Is it just above Aleppo? Would that be? Yes, yeah, it's, of... it's not far from Aleppo. No. That's the kind of major, the closest rise. So is it almost like a gateway... Um, would it be a state or a kingdom or a county? I'm not it's sure. Ca- it's a county of it. What would have been set up during, as the first crusaders came out of Asia Minor, down through the mountains um, into northern Syria, one faction, if you like, had branched off sort of east and inland yeah. towards Edessa, which had, which had an Armenian ruler. And there'd been a kind of coup, effectively, yeah. in the city. It had taken into Latin hands. And there was, a, yeah, there was, it was a sort of western south the point county. i suppose i'm just clarifying in my mind is this um vital to the route to get to jerusalem which is at this time in the uh, psychology of the western mind the center of the world no it's not no. and that's what's interesting it isn't it's sort of if you're pushing east out through northern syria towards kind of mesopotamia right. it's on the way 
But what's interesting about Odessa is it's the, the one that's going to cause you least bother if it goes. In terms of, if you were to take that overland route through Asia Minor, down northern Syria and down the coast towards Jerusalem, which wasn't the major pilgrim route. I mean, normally you'd, you'd sort of go by sea. But that aside, it's in that sense the least important strategically. However, it still had value and significance and importance, not just because it had been the first of the crusader you know, gains in the you know the broader quote unquote Holy Land, but because it was the site of uh, sacred relics of Saint Thaddeus and Saint Thomas, and um, it was in and of itself an important. Um, and it disrupts city. this this master narrative of the divinely favoured Latins or Franks. I'm not quite sure which is the best term to use. They're pretty much interchangeable. Interchangeable. Okay, well, that's handy. So okay, let's from from that. I think we've got a, a good contextual understanding of what's going on um, as 1147 gets going. Let's go from that to your first scene that we're going to look at, which is in June, and you've got Louis the Seventh of France and his wife Eleanor of Aquitaine. That might be a name that rings a bell in many medieval minds, should I say. Um, they're setting out from Paris. What's happening? So what's been happening in France? For the, the past few years, when we get to this point in, uh, in June 1147, is that Louis VII, King of France, married to Eleanor of Aquitaine, who in, in, you know, students of Plantagenet history will know best as uh, the wife of Henry II, well, Henry II was her second husband. Uh, at this point, uh, as a younger woman, she's married to Louis VII of France. Louis VII has been gearing up to go on crusade. Now, when news of the fall of Edessa had reached Europe. It had it had been acted upon by Pope Eugene the Third. Eugene the Third was a Cistercian monk who'd become Pope, the the first of of only two Cistercians to become Pope. He had uh, issued a papal bull calling on Western rulers in general to repeat the deeds of their forefathers and go and avenge the taking of Edessa. It's called Quantum Predecessores, you know, and it's it's about how many popes before us have, have have told you this is what you should be going to do. Eugene had, had then readdressed the same ball to specifically to Louis the Seventh, who he knew was gearing up to go on a crusade himself. Now during the, the late spring, between Easter and, and the early summer of 1147, Louis had been finalising his preparations to leave on crusade. And there had been an enormous amount of pageantry in France associated with this. At Easter, for example, Louis the Seventh, Eugene the Third, and the key so the third character in this in this story, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, the great sort of Cistercian abbot and uh, and man of of wide ranging influence ac- across Latin Europe, had got together at the Abbey of Saint Denis and had blessed a kind of great new golden cross there. They had been thrashing out their plans for this crusade. Bernard had been on an enormous preaching tour, which had kicked off at Vézelay in northern Burgundy, uh, where he'd sort of torn his clothes to make crosses for all the people. He'd been exhorting the people across France to join this crusade. Here in June was the last point of that pageantry, the last point at which Louis was about to leave. So on the 11th of June, he went to, uh, to a leper colony and washed the feet of lepers, you know, the, you know, the absolute inversion of the, the might, you know, the might of kingship, the humblest, most penitent kind of Christian thing a king could ceremonially do. He goes washing the feet of lepers. Eleanor of Aquitaine, his queen, is kind of hanging around outside. It's June. It's extremely hot. As she almost faints with having to put up with all this nonsense. When Louis is done washing the feet of lepers, he goes to Saint-Denis once again and takes the oriflamme the sacred banner of French kingship, and, and which is always held before you know, French royal armies as they go into battle. He takes the oriflamme and with that sets out on this, what's going to be this momentous journey in the footsteps of the First Crusaders, overland through Europe, down the Danube, towards Hungary, through the Balkans to Constantinople, from Constantinople across Asia Minor to Syria. This is the projected route he's going to take. And he's going to take with him this sort of band of Templars who are going to guard his army, uh, he's going to leave France as regent of uh, Abbot Suger of Saint Denis itself. So this is the moment a great Christian king leaves his kingdom. Will he come back? Nobody knows. His wife is by his side. That's quite unusual. We see lots of, of manuscript depictions of this um, of this journey that they're about to take together. On a personal level, 
the marriage between these two people is, is, is not in a wonderful place. Will that suffi- survive the journey? All of these questions are set up in this moment. Mm. Uh, it seems to me like a moment full of dramatic tension. And when, you, when I was reading, actually, through your descriptions of the early stages of Crusades, it's almost like... Um, reminded me a little bit of the the process or the anatomy of, of a crusade the early stages is it's this process which is almost like getting a, an american presidential election going you've mm-hmm. got to kind of get your celebrity backers you've got to win support you've got to find finance you've got to have some great public displays of enthusiasm all these things seem to be coming together um because of course they happened most notably in the 1090s when you had the first crusade and um was it the Council of Claremont? And, yeah, and yeah. That well, happened. And this is being repeated now, isn't it? Two generations later. So there's a great sense of excitement there. If I could just get you to dwell on the scene for a moment. So this is Paris, mm-hmm. 12th century Paris. What do we know about this at this time? Was it a, a big city already? Or It is the sort of heart of a, a relatively small and relatively weak um, French royal domain, French royal kingdom. Uh, in which large parts of what we now think of as France, you know, Greater France, are held more or less independently. You know, Eleanor, as Duchess of Aquitaine, had married Louis because she sort of supposedly brought with her, you know, one of the great lordships of the French South Southwest. Normandy has been in the hands of you know, Dukes of Normandy, and then will be sort of connected with the Kingdom of England for a long time. The same for Anjou, Maine, terrain. So the point is, large parts of France are not really under the control of the French king. Uh, Paris is, you know, appropriately smaller to a relatively small French kingdom. However, that's not to say it's without glory, without splendour. This is still where a French king, the descendant, albeit not entirely lineal, of Charlemagne is uh, is setting out from. And to me, it's it's a moment which is full of expectation and hope, isn't it? And that's what we're looking at. It is full of expectation and hope. You're right to mention um, Louis's reputation as, in Eleanor's supposed words, a monk and not a king. Louis hadn't been born... To be a king, his elder brother uh, was being trained for kingship. Louis was being trained for the cloister or to be to be a, a, a bishop. Only when his brother's horse tripped over a pig when he was out riding, he was thrown from the horse and killed. Was Louis sort of bumped up a little sort of Henry VIII style mm. um, through the, the ranks of the royal family? Uh, and and there's not always a sense that Louis was perfectly happy with being a king himself. You're absolutely right also to say that this is a moment of high expectation. How did it go? Do you want to move from the descriptive history into the analysis a little bit? Um, it was a disaster. I mean, this, this bit of the Second Crusade was a disaster. Conrad III, the German king, had set out a few weeks before Louis with 100-some miles on him in any case. They arrive in staggered stages at Constantinople, where the emperor, Manuel I Komnenos, grandson of Alexios I Komnenos, who'd been the Byzantine emperor, who had called the first crusaders to come and help him rid his Christian empire of the perfidious Turks. Well, Manuel Komnenos had done no such thing. He was a lot less happy to see these crusaders turning up, as it were, on his doorstep. Um, However, he sort of hurried them across the Bosphorus into Asia Minor, really sort of let them take their chances. And the whole thing yeah, was a disaster. I mean, Conrad III's German crusaders went ahead. They were largely cut to pieces and returned to Constantinople with their tails between their legs. Conrad III himself had been very badly injured. Louis arrived. The French and uh, German crusaders kind of unite. Uh, they set off for another bash at getting across Asia Minor. And find it ain't too easy. It's very hilly, you know, mountainous countryside. It's extremely hot in the summer. It's extremely wet when they go in the winter. So in the autumn of uh, 1147, Louis arrives in Constantinople. Uh, in January, he kind of strikes out, uh, you know, across Asia Minor. Um, on the 6th of January, he is nearly killed. As they try to cross a place called Mount Cadmus, uh, the French Crusaders are set upon by light Turkish cavalry who specialise in breaking up the discipline of more heavily armed Frankish knights with long columns of unarmed pilgrims with them, which is what a sort of crusader army would have looked like. Louis's army breaks up across Mount Cadmus and is nearly is nearly ripped to pieces. Louis himself had to scramble on a on a sort of on a rock and, and hide himself from being personally captured and potentially worse. They only survive because they hand over command of the troops to the Templars, fifty Templars under the the, the command of Uncle Gilbert 
who are accompanying them. Against the background of all of this, even before Louis had reached Constantinople, he'd almost run out of money. He was sending back to Suger in, in France saying, advance me some more cash, I'm, I'm running low here. By the time they sort of stagger towards the southern coast of Asia Minor, he's broke again, he's borrowing money off the Templars. He eventually takes ship and arrives in Antioch, northern Syria, the Principality of Antioch, the, the Latin Christian state, he arrives there in March, really sort of staggering, having been beaten up badly on the journey, um, humiliated really, broke again, still borrowing money off the Templars. When they all convene and decide what they're actually going to do now, they're, now that they're there, instead of rescuing Edessa, which is by this stage long gone, I mean it's been um, you know, four years almost since Edessa fell, they sort of scratch their heads and say, well what are we going to do now we're here? And someone comes up with a bright idea, I know what, let's attack Damascus. Damascus, at no stage during the Crusader period, or since, has ever been an easy target to no, conquer. No, isn't this uh, later where Saladin comes from, or his power base as well? Uh, well, Saladin's a Kurd, but yeah, I mean, he. so Damascus is one of his... Um, but it, 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 the buried. point I was making more broadly was that it, it is always seen <laughs> or considered a, a stronghold, no? Strong, yeah, exactly. And it's the one... Look, had Damascus ever fallen into uh, Latin Christian hands, the story of the Crusades might have gone very differently. Right. But it never did, and on virtually every attempt to attack or take it by any form of crusader army whatsoever, uh, humiliation beckons. This has been the case in um, 1129. It's the case again uh, in 1148. Mm. And uh, there's a a disastrous attempt to attack Damascus, which is over almost before it's begun, within five days. the, The whole crusader army that's been summoned from the west, that's arrived with kings at its head, is beaten and and broken up in five days. So this is an inversion, really, of the story of the First Crusade, isn't yeah. it? Which yeah. was characterised by luck, maybe, or it was interpreted very much at the time as as divine providence or grace that was behind them. Well, there's also that, there is also much more competent leadership on the First Crusade. Uh, yes, the, it's it's impossible to read the story of the First Crusade without going. Oh my God, they did what? Again and again and again and again. But you don't get that lucky. By the time the First Crusaders arrived in a very fragmented and turbulent um, Holy Land, riven with faction within the the sort of Syrian Seljuk Sunni world and between that world and and the Fatimid Shia world based in Egypt, they were battle hardened. They were like there for war. They were, you know, they were. They were ready to walk through absolutely any kind of torment, discomfort, pain to achieve their goal. And they'd done it the hard way, you know. But in the Second Crusade, these guys turn up thinking, well, so long as we follow the same kind of path, surely we can do this too. And the truth is, no, you absolutely cannot. And you certainly can't do it with a leader like Louis the Seventh. Really, how do we characterise this first scene? It starts off with Louis in a moment of hope in Paris. It starts off with Louis in a moment of hope in Paris with his wife, you know, hanging around outside, uh, waiting for him to get done with the sort of pieties uh, and set off on this great journey. And it ends with uh, a succession of military humiliations um, with vast debts accrued by the French crown. And with Louis and Eleanor, um, by the time they get home, effectively estranged because you know a side note to this is that when they get to Antioch Eleanor meets her uncle by this time the prince of Raymond Prince of Antioch and decides that he's actually a much better bet than her husband who has uh, not showered himself in glory at this point Henry II whom Eleanor comes comes to marry as a sort of partial result of her experiences on crusade is late in his life offered the kingdom of Jerusalem just as uh, his grandfather you know had been king of Jerusalem King Falk so that the all these things are connected and I think what this episode in the beginning in 1147 does is illustrate just how bound together east and west are in this period well we've been following really one thread of narrative which started off in 1147 and tapered on through um, the progress of Louis' crusade. But of course things are happening in parallel at the same time and our second scene we're going to examine is in July 1147, which is a month later than our first scene, um, which was in Paris, of course. Now we're in Mecklenburg, modern-day Germany, and another crusading army 
entirely is marching against the Slavic tribes people known collectively as the Wends. Have I pronounced that correctly? The Wends, yeah. yeah the yeah, Wends. The Wends, maybe, I suppose. We'll, we'll call them Wends for our purpose now. So, uh, really, what we what we doing now? Are we getting um, off the motorway of crusading history and going on to one of the A-roads to see one of the slightly lesser-known crusades that does happen concurrently that you were talking about before? Well, at this stage, it, yes, it's not even a, an A-road. It's sort of coming off the motorway of crusading and turning into a sort of little country lane, but it's going to be built <laughs> up into an A-road as crusading history comes along. The connecting force here really is Bernard of Clairvaux. When the Second Crusade, which we've just been talking about, was, was being preached, one of the, you know, Bernard of Clairvaux didn't just spend his time preaching in France. He also went to Germany because it was important to convince Conrad III, King of the Germans, that he too should be a part of this. However, during the course of Bernard's kind of preaching tour, if you like, he goes to Frankfurt and at Frankfurt encounters a group of Saxon nobles who say, look, we're all behind this idea of crusading, okay? We get it. Go fight Christ's enemies, receive remission of sins, do the Lord's work. This all sounds fantastic. However, have you not considered this, Bernard? On our doorstep, just east of here, there are quite a lot of non-Christians. They may not be Muslims, but they're certainly not Christians, who we are absolutely itching to fight. And wouldn't it be just as beneficial to the kingdom of, of, uh, of Christ at large if we were just to sort of stay here and fight them instead? Now, there's two ways of looking at this. One is you can, you know, it, my instinct is that if it were me in that situation, I might have said, you must be joking, get out there, join, you know, join the crusade, we're going to the kingdom of Jerusalem and, and that's an end on it. However, this is Bernard of Clairvaux and Bernard of Clairvaux Mm-hmm. takes a very broad and really quite inventive view of crusading. And he is extraordinarily nimble to the point of being disingenuous at times in his theological thinking. Previous to this, Bernard's sort of first great crusading project had been to help build the rule of the Templars and help the Templars get um, sponsorship. Are you talking about him now? And I just really want to um, get my pen out, if you like, and draw a great big black nine, uh, line under this name, Bernard of Clairvaux, because he's maybe a character that, if you're familiar with the period, you're familiar with him, of course, but he just has this massive influence at this time. Could you just, to take one step backwards, give us a little bit of an overview of him? Because it seems to me, from the reading that I've done, that as a preacher, he carried enormous powers of rhetoric and persuasion. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, look, if you know this period, you know Bernard of Clairvaux, but he's certainly, no, he's not a sort of a character who is, you could walk down the street and say, anybody heard of him? However, if you'd walk down the street um, in the 12th century, everybody would have heard of Bernard of Clairvaux. Born around 1090, decided to, you know, having had a, a sort of, being visited in a dream by the divine spirit, decided he was going to go and become a monk, joined up with the brand new order that was really making um, big strides in the early 12th century, the Cistercians, a reformed, extremely ascetic uh, order of monasticism, which um, which shunned the sort of the grandeur of the Cluniacs, who had been, you know, the, the, the last big new sort of cool kind of monastic order, and went in for absolute spareness of living, hard physical labour, isolation from the world in uh, monastic houses built deliberately on sort of poor, scratty land where nobody else in their right mind would think of living. Bernard himself um, was a a great sort of tormentor of his own body. Uh, He would, you know, fast to the point of starvation, physically extremely frail. However, what he, he lacked in kind of physical presence, he made up for in this enormous written voice. He was an inveterate letter writer who would sort of pester and and harangue and cajole the kings and popes and noblemen but not just them the sort of runaway nuns and kind of aimless young men of Europe with these letters exhorting them to improve their their piety how does this one go is there a different story that plays out here right so let me let's pick up the story we've we've sketched Bernard of Clairvaux so in uh, March 1147 he's in Frankfurt and and he's, he's pitched effectively by the Saxon nobles saying we don't want to go crusading on Jerusalem. We don't want to leave town. 
but we're more than willing to go fight the pagans just over the, you know, the other side of the river. And Bernard of Clairvaux likes the idea and decides to sell it to his protégé, Pope Eugene III. Pope Eugene III was the first of two ever Cistercian popes, and he had really fallen under Bernard's spell. So Bernard had a lot of sway with Eugene III. So he, he was in touch directly with Eugene III, who on the 13th of April, just as Eugene's about to spend Easter with Louis VII, decides to grant another papal bull, Divina Dispensatione, which says, OK, fine, if you're a Saxon noble and you want to go and fight pagans, you know, and, and push, you know, push east and expand the boundaries of Christendom within Europe, that's totally fine, and I will grant the same remission of sins for people fighting pagans and pagan tribes people in northeast Europe as I will grant to everybody who's going on this crusade of the Holy Land. And that's really important, and maybe a point we let, let's emphasise a little bit more, which is, why is everyone going on crusade? What's the personal motivation? It is because the reward, the spiritual reward, is remission of sins, either partial or full. Any confessed sins that you have committed on earth will be wiped clean, and your, your chances of getting to heaven in a timely fashion are massively increased through this penitential pilgrimage, this engagement in the Holy War. So what Eugene says about this bull in April 47 is absolutely, yep, same remission of sins as going to Jerusalem, now apply to fighting these tribes people who are known collectively as the Wends. Okay. As we move forward historically, if you want to do that at this point, what we're going to see in the Baltic is a major crusading arena. Now the purpose will remain driving... Christian archbishoprics and dioceses and Christian German lordships northeast through the Baltic uh, because this is extremely rich trading country, it's extremely rich in natural resources, it's, it's fairly temperate although quite cold in the winter and they will become, you know, by the 13th century institutionalised crusading because the Teutonic Knights move in. A military order modelled on the Templars set up in 1191 during the Siege of Acre who move their base to modern Poland and become a sort of permanent, you know, engage in permanent crusade. Crusading has changed, and it's it's available in different forms and different sort of um, proof strengths, depending on how, how, well, how much you want to buy I it. I can't let you escape this scene without asking you what became of the Wends, if you know, or I, I don't imagine they're still in operation today, so they fell at some point. But... I don't think there are many Wends about. The, the difficulty, as always, is that the Wends are a non-literate pagan tribes people, and there may not actually have been a bunch of people going around going, we're the Wends, la da 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 da. Uh, the Wends are a group of, you know, ling- probably linguistically defined uh, group of interlinked tribes, people including the Pomeranians and the Lithuanians and the Lats and the Finns and the, the Livs, you name it. Um, what actually happened in the, in the longer term is that all of these different tribes, Slavic tribes, one by one kind of ground down are absorbed into the sort of broader Christian world. And by the time we get to, well, what should we say, the 15th, 16th century, there are Christianized states throughout the Baltic. Um, as, you know, even the Grand Duchy of Lithuania converts to Christianity. Well, this is the interesting in the thing, as you said, about 1147, because we are seeing this historical project gathering momentum, aren't we? We've looked at the first scene, which you might characterise as the big macro history, and then we're seeing things play out on a smaller level. Let's go to the third of your choices then, which is in October of the same year, so October 1147. So we've got to imagine these things happening in parallel. So Louis is closing in on Constantinople. Um, The first assault on the Wends is winding down for the winter because, of course, there were crusading seasons, I suppose. Um, And this is probably a place you would never connect, um, well, you wouldn't immediately anyway, in your historical mind but we're going to go to Lisbon right on the edge of Western Europe modern day Portugal where a crusading army is about to score a major victory what's going on well in a sense this draws a lot of what we've been talking about together you know crusading arenas that aren't Jerusalem the second crusade in in kind of macro terms victories in unlikely places in 1147 Bernard of Clairvaux's big preaching tour you know crusading fever has, has hit Western Europe there's an army of about 10,000, quote-unquote, Brits and uh, Flemings, mostly, but a, a richly variegated mix of people. And we know that because the ordinances 
for managing the army dealt with what would happen with lots of fights among the Crusaders between people from different places. They set out from Dartmouth and they take this route. You know, they sail the southern coast of France, they put ashore in, in Galicia in northwest Spain, and then they join up with a man called Afonso Henriquez. Afonso Henriquez, the conqueror, born in Guimarães in northern what's now northern Portugal. England played a football match there the other day. He's setting up the sort of county in what will become the Kingdom of Portugal which is, is centred around Porto, or Porto. And the broader situation in the, the Iberian Peninsula at this point is that the Reconquista is in full swing. Southern Spain, if you like, is ruled ultimately by the Amoravids, a Berber sect, Islamic sect from um, Morocco, previously in the century taken control of most of what you know what we call Al Andalus, Muslim Spain. As our English and Flemish Crusaders arrive on this kind of western coast of uh, of what's now Spain and Portugal, they stop off naturally to take on water, and they they are implored to get involved in Afonso Enrique's mission to expand his county of Portugal, which he's sort of convert in the process of converting into a kingdom of Portugal. And the major target that will help him do that is the city of Lisbon, you know, about 180 miles south of Porto. al Ushbuna is a Muslim city, uh, extremely well-placed. Just... How long had that been a Muslim city for Lisbon? You know, um, um, hundreds I mean, of years. Hundreds, yeah, as, as long as... It, it's, well in, it's well within the sort of the broader Al-Andalus, you know, it, it's, it's not a Christian city, it's, mm. it's an Islamic city. It's uh, extremely well defended within the mouth of the River Tagus, about, I think it's about eight miles um, upriver, so mm. it's protected from the Atlantic. It's said at this time to do more trade with North Africa than any other city. Now Palermo might have something to say about that, but you get the picture. There's gold, there's olive oil, there's you know citrus fruits. There's, it's, it's a rich, wealthy, well-to-do city. If you're Alfonso Enriquez, and your mission is to expand your kingdom of Portugal, it's the vital place that you take mm. in the south. So here come 10,000 kind of roughnecks from, uh, from oh. England and Holland, you know. <laughs> here are just the people to help you do it. In 1142, Afonso tried his hand at Lisbon uh, with some ships of some French pilgrims who'd been heading for the Holy Land along the same route, but he'd failed to take it. Now, however, there's real firepower heading his way. So May 1147, these 10,000 crusaders set off. 16th of June, they reach Porto. By the 30th of June, uh, or thereabouts, um, they are at Lisbon. They meet Afonso Enriquez, who's marched south from Porto with an army, including, guess who, the Templars. The 1st of July, these combined troops, having disembarked their ships, storm the suburbs of Lisbon. And there begins a July, August, September, you know, a three and a half month siege that has all the elements of siege warfare in the Middle Ages. And how long did this siege go on for then, until the outcome that I think we've all guessed at? Well, yeah, uh, so by October, so if you're being besieged, what you need to hope for is either that the Crusading army gets bored or diseased or hungry themselves and goes away, or you're relieved um, which is to say another army from someone you're allied with comes and, and helps you by driving the army away. By October of 1147, it becomes clear that there's not going to be a relief of Lisbon because the Amoravids, this Berber uh, North African dynasty, who are nominally in control of the whole of Al-Andalus, southern Spain, have problems of their own. Back in Morocco, uh, a revolution is underway and another even more extreme and puritanical sect known as the Almohads, are about to seize power within this, uh, this broader sort of cross Gibraltar, if that's a word, world. They're not going to come and help, effectively. So on October the 23rd, 1147, the citizens do uh, the only thing left to them, which is sue for peace. Now, under the terms of siegecraft, by and large, if the city is stormed, i.e. if it falls um, because the besiegers take it, then all bets are off and it's there to be sacked. If there's a negotiated peace, usually you allow the citizens, or what's supposed to happen is the citizens are allowed to leave with their possessions and their lives. Now, there's a little bit of a grey area with Lisbon because miners had succeeded in bringing down a portion of the walls. But on the other hand, there was a suit for peace. Peace is accepted. Unfortunately, 
it's not a peaceful transition of power. So you have a, a degree of squabbling between the different factions of Crusaders, Portuguese, Flemish and English who all claim different portion of the right to plunder. But what happens soon enough is that there is a, a sack, a, a sort of murderous sack. You know, maybe it's, a, you know, we want to call it a massacre. We're quibbling terms. A lot of people die. Uh, the Mozarabic bishop of Lisbon has his throat slit. So there are attacks not just on, on Muslims, but on Christians of a, of a different, you know, of a different right. It's a pretty bloody scene. And what you end with by the end of October is that Lisbon is now in Christian hands. Some of the Crusaders go off, follow the, the southern coast through the Straits of Gibraltar and over winter in Italy. Others decide to stay in Lisbon for the winter because, um, you, you know, the, the sea lanes are now closing up. Either way, what happens is Lisbon has been taken. And as it will prove in retrospect, this was really the major victory of the whole Second Crusade. This crusade that set out to liberate Edessa, which had fallen in 1144, was diverted to Damascus, grew a little offshoot in the Baltic. Really, it's sort of weirdly, as it seems to us now, its major achievement was the seizure of Lisbon. Well, we've gone from Paris to Germany, shall we call it, and we've ended up at Lisbon. And funnily enough, we never ever actually got to Jerusalem, which was the destination <laughs> that people always wanted to get to. But well, we that's the story there. of 1147, I was afraid. Uh, exactly. Never quite getting up there, but ending up somewhere else. Um, thank you. That's been a wonderful tour through the year. I've got a bit of um, supplementary business for you. I can't remember if I reminded you about this before. So let me throw this at you like a boomerang and see if it comes back. Um, if you could bring one tangible object back from the year 1147 to have with you, you could maybe have it in this nice house in stain somewhere if you could make some room. What would you like, a tangible object from the time? Well, I've, I've been thinking about this and... You know, I had some rather sort of grandiose thoughts about maybe taking the Oriflam, but that would upset a lot of people. I think what would any good crusader want, and I'll tell you what they would want, would be a sliver of the true cross. Now, in Jerusalem, where unfortunately we didn't visit, although we, we set out in that direction at the beginning, was, you know, the greatest relic in the Christian world. It was a large portion of Christ's cross, and this was lost to Saladin um, in the Battle of Hattin and never recovered. But if you were a particularly dignified or worthy or just lucky crusader and you made it to Jerusalem and you palled up with whoever the king of Jerusalem was at this point, if you were really nice to him, then he might get down to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre mm. and shave you off the tiniest little pencil shaving of Christ's cross itself, which you could then take home and sort of uh, commission a kind of grand reliquary out of precious metals and, and God knows what, in whatever shape took your fancy, probably that of a cross, in which to display this treasure. And you would then have brought home the greatest knick-knack, the greatest trinket that you possibly could have. And wherever you displayed it would forever be a part of Jerusalem. And so I thought, greedy as that is, but you did offer, I'll take just the merest little shaving of the true cross, please, because I'm going to make it to Jerusalem. I love that idea. I love the idea of somewhere in stains having a shard of the true cross. I wonder if you'd be a bit more productive at your writing desk if it was just there above you. Thank you very much, Dan. That's been a terrific tour through the time. A few words left for the book. Has it taken you years and years and years or did it come together in a whirl of excitement? I think, like a lot of books, it's uh, you have, a, or I always have, several books kind of bubbling around in my mind at once. Uh, so I've been thinking about it for probably more than a decade and, and working on parts of it intensely for the last four years. Um, the writing was quick, the thinking was slow. I think that's always got to be the way it is. Well, thank you very much for sharing this with us. I've been reading a book, been engrossed with it over the weekend and it charges along like so many of your other books does and I'm sure it will be as I said right at the beginning, an exhilarating tour for any reader who's interested in the time. Thank you very much, Dan Jones. No, thanks for having me. Hello, I'm Artemis, and I work on the Travels Through Time podcast. We hope you enjoyed that conversation. I was particularly interested by Dan's explanation of why people went on crusades, and also the revelation that the crusades encompassed conflicts against not just Muslims, but pagans and other Christians as well. 
You can check out our new website at tttpodcast.com where you can find links to episodes from season one and season two of Travels Through Time. Don't forget to visit our pages on historytoday.com where you can find articles from their archive written by experts for the world's leading serious history magazine. For example, for more information on what Dan and Peter were discussing in today's episode, you can read The Crusades, A Complete History by Jonathan Phillips or Why Didn't the Crusades Succeed by Harry Munt. Also available to read is an obituary of England's only Pope, who allegedly died in 1159 from choking on a fly in his wine. That's The Death of Aidan IV by Richard Cavendish. That's it for this episode. We'll be back next Tuesday, the 10th of September, for a trip to 1934 and the fractious London streets with the best-selling author, Thomas Harding. Till next time, goodbye.